I'm Natasha Ryan with Premier Risk Solutions, and this is our video series, Strong, Safe, and True, where we sit down with leaders in the security world to talk about things that are relevant to today in our industry. And today I have Scott Walker, longtime military law enforcement. Give me a little bit more about yourself, please. Sure. I spent 20 years in the military and law enforcement and then transitioned to the private sector where I became a corporate investigator. And now I work in Phoenix, Arizona, and I have my own investigation service practice. But I love talking to people like yourself, Natasha, about where we're going in the future, what's the future of our industry, and how sure. we can help make this industry and, and our economy more resilient with better people, processes, and technology. And that is exactly what we're talking about, how the people, the processes, the technology all impact risk. And with risk mitigation, when we were talking the other day, you said, you know, really right at this very moment, we are in a time of crisis and you expect it to sustain for five to eight years. Kind of talk about that for me, Scott. Yeah, five to, five to eight more years. I think, we, you know, it's, it's one thing to say, oh, we're in a crisis everybody knows we've been in a pan global pandemic that's unprecedented for the last year and a half. And, but it's been, our crisis has been going on longer than that. I just finished the book, uh, The Fourth Turning by Will Strauss and Neil Howe. They're demographers that wrote back in the nineties that we would be in a, and in, in, in there are four phases kind of um, in our world over a hundred years or 80 years or so. Every 20 years we go through a, a, a turning they call it. And it's like a change in season. But so anyways, uh, we've been in in a crisis since really 2006, and and what was what kind of the in, early indicators there was the housing market crash, right? And so the reason why I say we're in this crisis for the next five to eight years is because uh, the 20 year cycle is going to be going on until the mid 2020s. So what does what I realized when I transitioned from law enforcement into the private sector was there really it was a great need for resiliency in our organization. We need people who had been kind of in battle or had been uh, tried in a crisis or an emergency. And who better than people coming out of the military or coming out of law enforcement? Because what I saw was that there was a lot of folks who just didn't have that kind of experience in the private sector. And these businesses, I felt, were going to suffer for it. So back in 2013, I started helping people transition and have been doing that. Uh, not until I read this book, The Fourth Turning, did I really understand um, that we we truly would be in a, in this crisis um, mode for till the mid twenty twenties. And so now, the for me, the crisis is, or the sense of importance is, we need to get more people into businesses to make them more resilient. That's kind of like a no duh, right? Everybody, right. Knows, you know, we need. You know, we've lost more businesses over the last year because of of this uh, pandemic. So. Uh, I'm advocating for bringing people in from law enforcement in the military. Just so happens that in law enforcement, twenty almost 20 years ago, we had planes crash into buildings. And so there was a big hiring spike for the military and law enforcement. And now we're at 20 years. They're going to be coming out of the military and law enforcement, uh, and they're going to be coming into the private sector. What does that mean? I want them to be entrepreneurs. I want them to be not just corporate security or investigations. I want them to go into business continuity. I want them to go into marketing and operations and all these other things that make up our business because I know that they'll bring that resiliency mindset with them and not just law enforcement. I also say public safety, our fire and EMS partners as well. So Scott, you say that and you say, you know, we, there's going to be more police officers in law and uh, military, especially with us seeing police departments being defunded. Right. So what does that look like for the security industry? Are we going to get a huge influx of police officers that, are, are done. They don't want to be in, in that line of work and now they want to go more private. Yeah. And not only that, uh, but we are, are, are a generation is just a new generation is just now coming on the scene and they're of age to be in, mil in the military and law enforcement. Um, so I'm talking about uh, the millennial generation. That generation is not as invested as my generation gen or our generation Gen Xers mm -hmm. or even the baby boomer generation that was before us. The boomers wanted the 20-year 
30 year plus retirement sure. gold watch, everything good to go. Right. And the, and then my generation kind of was raised on that. Although we're not so sure about that. Does it need to be a 20 year thing? And so we kind of have that question mark hang, hanging over our head. What else can we do? Right. And that will be influence, influential, but the big, the two big things to go kind of back to the, the crux of your question, the two big things that I think are going to influence transition is that point of we've got people that are hitting their 20 that are military and law enforcement, or they're at a point where they're just doing the math. Do I stay for like I did, I did the, the federal government math and I was like, okay, 1.5% at 50 uh, years old is what I'll be taking with me of my high 10 or, or uh, high three rather. And so I did that math and the private sector paid better. There was better opportunities there. And I felt like I could be more resilient there. I didn't realize how much work it would be, by the way. <laughs> that's that's some, maybe for another discussion. <laughs> but the other thing is our millennials are going to are coming into the workforce. They will outnumber uh, Gen Xers and baby boomers in t- by 2025. They're not all up. They're the, the, what is called the creative generation. They're not all about doing uh, things that don't involve technology. And so, you know, a, a lot of the public safety roles and military roles don't involve technology. They're still involved going out there and being in public or being on the street and, and doing uh. very physical things. That's not what this generation in mass, by the way, and I'm not blanketing everybody. I'm not sure, s- sure. calling them snowflakes or anything Generality. like that. Yeah, there, yeah. there will be people that will want to serve, but in mass, they won't as much as the boomer and the Gen X uh, generations did. Sure. So again, my sense of urgency is, do we need to reform law enforcement? Sure, there's things that we can do to make things better and, and change things. But now we've got kind of a double whammy, this perfect storm. People are, are going to be leaving en masse. And then we have people that just don't want to fill those roles. Where yeah. I live in Phoenix, they're down, Phoenix Police Department's down 500 officers. They, in 2020, they hired 25. 15 made it off of field training. So to fill that gap of 500 right. officers, they had 15. Seattle's down kind of a ton of officers too. And, yeah. and we'll continue. So when we talk about yep. defunding, we should be talking about reimagining rather than defunding. Right. Okay. So, you know, the overall theme and especially like attracting people, I think to any job, any sector is they want to feel invested in, right? Like you want to feel like, you matter. You don't want to be a number. So um, this is your this is your big thing. Invest in people, yeah. right? Yeah. So, you know, how does that come into play when you're also competing with AI, right? Like, how does that? How do you or robotics or right? Yeah, how do you find the balance and where to put your money? You know, yeah. as an employer. Yeah. What, and that's why I say like AI is great, um, but it's not going to replace uh, humans. Humans are still, we still need creatives and we still need people that, that can um, think dynamically. You know, artificial intelligence right now, will it be used more in the future? Yes. I think there will be positions on the boards of directors of companies that will be there for artificial intelligence or boards will be making decisions with artificial intelligence input. Um, but artificial intelligence right now, today, as it stands, is is very infantile, and maybe that's even giving it more than I should. But um, it, it's go- it's going to be a tool that we will use. It's not going to probably for a very long time replace humans uh, and what humans do. But uh, we still need to our our companies, our organizations, our governments still need to invest in people. And we, the people, need to invest in ourselves. And so that's where I talk about um, organizations uh, will use some uh, level of art- artificial intelligence, machine learning, and robotics to replace um, the kind of mundane jobs or the jobs that are too dangerous to do for a human. Um, those things will come into play. Um, and and, and those things, that's all good. That that sh- that uh, increases profit margins and makes companies more efficient. Makes uh, places safer for workers. I mean, you think about you know unloading a cargo ship. Can you imagine if humans still did that un- right, uh, unloaded right, cargo? Right, right, you know, yeah. now we have everything's containerized, much safer. 
Um, but you, you, the people that are doing these jobs need to invest in themselves. No longer is it okay to say, I don't understand something. You could go on your phone and watch a video on how to do that. You know, my wife and I packed the bearings on our, our travel trailer and redid that by, while watching a YouTube video. And I'm not mechanical at all. So if you can learn something um, you just learn it differently than what we used to by cracking sure. a book or going and talking to somebody or doing an apprenticeship, something like that. I, it's just a little different. And uh, this future generation is learning in 15 second increments. They go to, my daughter just sent me a video. She's in a, a, a master's social work uh, program with her college. And she sends me a TikTok video of somebody talking about ADD and ADHD in 15 seconds, explained it. I, not that I How agree with you. How do you explain that in 15 seconds? <laughs> I'll send you the video. <laughs> <laughs> not that this is, these are, are good things. I just think that this is how um, things are evolving. And I, and I think that there's no excuse anymore to say, I don't understand something. Or you can say that, but there's, there are options You got to find a way to you, figure it out. You got to invest because the future is here. It's now, it, uh, we're, we're moving forward. And I don't want to see anybody get left behind. Everybody has value. And I want everybody to understand uh, what that technology can do and you leverage it for your advantage. But it also uh, explains or it, it brings a lot more risk to our organizations because now you have, you know, we, we talked about uh, bring your own device in corporate security back in 2014. That was a big deal. Oh, well, you know, you, you can bring your own tablet, you can bring your own laptop, you can bring your own cell phone to work and you can do work stuff on it. Now we're talking about IoT. Uh, information is is everywhere, and I mm -hmm. want to bring my Alexa into work. But Alexa listens, and what if you work for a competing company? Right. You know, is that okay? And again, I don't have answers for these things, but I do think that this is what's going to propel um, the need for people who understand that risk and can help companies mitigate that risk. Okay, so I want to talk about what stops companies from actually uh, wanting to learn the technology, wanting to change. Um, you know, we all get comfortable and I can't tell you how many times I have to Google, how do I change the format of this PDF? <laughs> I have to do it's it. It's out you there, know? right? <laughs> it's out there. You can find it. It may take me a little bit longer than someone 10 years younger than myself, but I will find it eventually, but the, there is a strong, um, and I think the longer people have been in it and are more accustomed, sometimes it's harder. There's more reticence to not, not want to change. So, yeah. you know, we talked about this and you talked about how you have to be ready for the war of the future. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to use that military term, we, um, can, can plan for the invasion of Eastern Europe. Uh, and we do plan for that in the military. But uh, what we're seeing from uh, the future war is what we're seeing today that literally has happened over the last couple of weeks. Uh, Russian hackers hacking our meat processing and our oil supplies. Yeah, the, that that that's a, what we <clears throat> what we call a training run. Uh, that is not um, th where they're really trying to hit that's us. That's not the be and, all end all, right? That no, is practice. this is this is yeah. them practicing to see what they can get into. And oh my gosh, I guess we can get this kind of access, and we can shut down these things and and those kinds of things. Um, so in it, our future war will always have, and and we do to a big, large extent today, have a cyber, cyber component to everything that we do. It used to be that we would talk about, let's say CCTV, and that was, you know, coaxial cables plugged into the back of a camera uh, on the side of a, of a wall in a building someplace. And it ran to some VMS system and maybe it right. recorded on digital, maybe it recorded on tapes. You know, it's just, it, it was not thought of as a, an IOT device. 
And, but it is today. I mean, we, we have everything is digital. Everything is information. You have full server racks that are dedicated to your, your CCTV systems now. So um, the folks who are managing those things are, are not the, oh, I'm just an integrator. I'm just an installer. I just I plug in the camera and I go away. You've got to be, have a lot of IT background now. So the war, the, my, my sense of urgency here is the war of the future will have a major cyber component to it. Um, and companies are on the front lines. And I'll use the example with, with China and in its expanse of building out um, uh, islands in, in its west of its actual land, at, uh, or excuse me, east of its land, and it's encroaching onto all of our partner com countries like Vietnam and, and the Koreas and, uh, or South Korea and, and uh, Taiwan, most importantly. So there are companies in Taiwan that provide major resources to the rest of the world, not only the United States, um, but they manufacture things on, on great mass that uh, we don't necessarily have the capacity to in the Americas. So if China invades Taiwan, it's not just, it, it, it's tragic that they'll be invading and, and, and citizens of Taiwan will be hurt but it will also impact the global economy. And now China knows this. This is nothing new for them. Right. But they, they've got to balance the, well, what's the Western response versus you know, the economic impact? We, we'll probably lose some jobs. We'll probably lose a few billion dollars, but we'll gain much more in their, they have a hundred year kind of outlook, right? So th that's why companies are on the front line of, of international conflict now. It, which it didn't it didn't used to be a, as much. I mean, let's take a look at World War II, and there was a tremendous economic impact. And, and what Hitler was trying to do and, and taking over all these countries to make one big kind of Germania or one German country, bringing all his countrymen back into his country, it had an economic impact as well. But we haven't seen it, it um a world war as impactful as what we, I hope we never see this. I'll say that first, but I think we may because the world is smaller now. And so supply chains are shorter. Um, and, and with technology, we're able to understand how everything is kind of interconnected. And so if you, if we lose a, a certain part of the world, um, we shouldn't be as impacted as we have been. But now we've been in the global pandemic and we see, oh yeah, well, you know, everybody's got to go work remote, but you can't work yeah. remote if you work in a manufacturing plant. How do you do that? Oh, we just don't make chips anymore. Right. That's not acceptable. We can't have that. We've seen what the global impact to the GPU sure. right. has and our chip shortage happens. So we can't fight the war of yesterday. We have to be ready for the war of tomorrow. Sorry, that was a long explanation. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> and you know, and you, you talk about this, like you've said this before, don't leave anyone behind because that's what creates the peace. And yeah. holistically, the goal is to make people and companies more resilient. Scott, unfortunately, we are running out of time. So give me like three takeaways that you would say companies can do right at this very moment to head in the right direction. Invest in your people. Uh, invest in uh, reforming archaic processes. So educate your people. Take a, a good hard look at why do we do what we do? If you have the most dangerous phrase that comes out next, which is we've always done it this way, then you need to change that process. It needs to be resilient. If you aren't, you don't have a process that's resilient, it will break down and it will cost you money or it will cost you time or it'll cost you something. Uh, everything comes back to capital, right? And then right. really invest in technology, but think about um, how you invest in your own cyber resilience and cyber security. Don't be reliant on a piece of technology that if it's taken away tomorrow, if it goes away tomorrow, it, it tanks your whole business. Right. You've got to invest in something that will be resilient and, and be resilient for, for decades. Um, and I know that's weird when you talk about cyber, but we've got to invest. In, I mean, building out a data center, if you had a choice, would you put it in India or would you put it in Pakistan? 
right? I, I would think people would put it in India because the, the, it's not a country that's necessarily at war with itself, right. whereas Pakistan is. So um, looking at those resiliencies and uh, across people, places, people, processes, and technology is really vastly important. All right, Scott, thank you so much for all your insight. Uh, I want to do a deeper dive with you another time, but for now, I just appreciate you coming on. And thanks to all of you for watching. Uh, be sure to come back to our website weekly, premierbisksolutions.com for more videos just like this one. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Scott. Thank you.